Good evening all and welcome to Deakin University and to the fifth annual Fusion Lecture sponsored by the Alfred Deakin <coughs> Research Institute. My name is David Lowe, I'm your host for this evening and um, like any host worth their salt, one of the first things I request is that you could please check your mobile phones and make sure they're either switched off or set to silent. Thank you very much. A word about the Fusion Lecture Series. This series features prominent thinkers on current public policy issues and is named in recognition of the intellectual and political legacy of Alfred Deakin, Australia's second Prime Minister and a leading figure in Australia's Federation. At a political level, among many other achievements, Deakin managed to form a fusion government comprised of different groups reaching consensus on important policy issues in the years 1909 to 10. At the level of ideas meeting policy, the fusion lectures also draw inspiration from Alfred Deakin's capacity for deep thinking across boundaries. We invite speakers to bring different ways of thinking to bear in interpreting and responding to some of the biggest policy challenges of our time, just as Alfred Deakin did in his time. We're very fortunate this evening to have from Papua New Guinea, Dame Carol Kidu, to deliver our fusion lecture for 2014, titled <laughs> People on the Move, Complex Dimensions and Moral Dilemmas. And to introduce Dame Carol and to add her welcome, I'm delighted now to invite Deakin University Vice-Chancellor, Professor Jane Den Hollander, to the podium. A very warm welcome to Deakin University's ladies and gentlemen, and to our beautiful waterfront campus, Deakin's headquarters in Geelong. I'm delighted that tonight we are going to welcome and celebrate and introduce Dame Carol Kiddu, who will present the 2014 Alfred Deakin Research Institute Fusion Lecture. The Fusion Lectures, as David Lowe has said, draw inspiration from Alfred Deakin, the great man after whom Deakin is named, a three-time Prime Minister of Australia and, of course, the dominant figure in Australia's first decade as a nation. Deakin was well ahead of his time in the importance and value he placed on global awareness and cross-cultural understanding, a concept we now value very highly at Deakin, and that is reflected in our World Week logo. And at that point, speaking of Deakin, I acknowledge the Deakin staff in the room, my Deakin colleagues, very nice, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, Lee Astheimer, the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Arts and Education, um, in which the um, Alfred Deakin Research Institute sits, um, led by David Lowe. Um, we take our, our responsibilities under our world need taking a global view but being inclusive, ensuring access, ensuring participation for those who would not otherwise have access to an education to have that opportunity with us. The Fusion Lectures draw inspiration from Alfred Deakin in bringing together different disciplines to bear in interpreting and responding to global and regional change. And if only we could think of that now as we face very significant issues right around our region. Deakin University's hometown of Geelong is undergoing its own challenges, as many of you will know. Initially built on the enormous wealth of wool and now experiencing the painful, grindingly slow transition to a new age in a digital era. We are watching the sunset on old-style manufacturing in Geelong Industries which have given workers certainty and which had secured Geelong and indeed Australia's future for nearly 70 years are gone. This can help bring us closer to the experiences faced facing our new neighbour, Papua New Guinea, our near neighbour, sorry, Papua New Guinea. And this evening we have a rare opportunity. We will hear from an inspirational, legendary Papua New Guinea politician and activist, Dame Carol Kitty. Dame Carol has devoted her life to improving conditions in PNG. She was Minister for Community Development from 2002 to 2011 and is known and highly regarded for fighting discrimination, helping women, helping children and the physically and mentally impaired in Papua New Guinea. She originally trained as a teacher in Queensland and taught for over 20 years primarily in Papua New Guinea. As a member of Papua New Guinea Parliament for three terms, Dame Carroll was a driving force behind a number of important legislative reforms, including the repeal of the Colonial Child Welfare Act, changes to the Criminal Code on Rape 
and sexual assault and new legislation on child sexual abuse and the sexual exploitation of children. Policy reforms initiated by Dame Carroll included the community-based policy for people with disability, revised national youth policy, sport for development policy, informal econ economy policy, a revised policy on gender, an integrated community development policy, and an urbanisation policy. She also established the Parliamentary Committee on HIV and AIDS in 2003, and the PNG Parliamentarians on Population and Development in 2008. Dan Carroll's international appointments have included membership of the James Cook University International Advisory Board of the Cairns Institute, the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, and she is presently a member of the Global High Level Taskwork on ICPD 2014 and beyond. Dame Carol Kudu is a non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute for International Policy and a board member of the Pacific Institute of Public Policy. Dame Carol's achievements have been recognised by her adopted country, where she has made a, was made a Dame Commander of the British Empire. She was also Pacific Person of the Year in, in 2007, the same year she received the International Women of Courage Award from the US Secretary of State. In 2009, Dame Carol Kudu was the first citizen of Papua New Guinea to become a Knight of the French Legion of Honour. And next week, on Wednesday, she will be one of our 2014 honorary doctorates. Ladies and gentlemen, a legend. Good evening to everyone. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, past and present of the land we are gathered on, but I also acknowledge my late husband's family, the Vahoi clan, Pari village, and the people of Moresby South electorate, who allowed me the privilege of representing them in parliament for 15 years, until my retirement in 2012. Without their support, I would not be here, because I certainly do not have the academic qualifications to deliver the 2014 Fusion Lecture, so I pay tribute to the people who gave me that position in Parliament. I thank the Alfred Deakin Research Institute for inviting me to address a somewhat hot topic of people on the move, complex dimensions and moral dilemmas. The present heat in this topic centres around our beautiful Manus Island, but that will only be a segment of my presentation. Many of you are more knowledgeable on the complex legal dilemmas and moral dilemma, legal di dimensions and moral dilemmas of the Regional Resettlement Agreement signed between Prime Ministers of our two nations. Undoubtedly, some of you are legal human rights and social activists on the matter and thus have researched it to the limit. Whereas for me, this issue of concern is one element in my very busy life and so I hope I do it some justice. As you are aware, or possibly you are aware, that in March this year, I was tasked by the Chief Secretary to the Papua New Guinea government to chair an expert panel under the auspices of the Papua New Guinea Immigration and Citizenship Service Authority, ICSA, to prepare a draft national refugee settlement policy for, a Papua, for Papua New Guinea. It was a matter of urgency at the time and we were given a very tight time frame. In fact, we were told to write a policy in 30 days. I ended up having to beg for 13 extra days because we'd only finished the consultations in 30 days. And so there was this very tight time frame to produce a report from both research and a consultative process, as well as to draft a policy and recommended implementation plan. There was a real sense of urgency because the transfer transferees were already on Manus Island in the Regional Processing Centre. The expert panel completed its task and submitted its report and a draft refugee policy. However, as in any nation, the political debate in the National Executive Council or Cabinet was obviously not smooth because it has now been withdrawn after such a long time from Cabinet and the way forward for the people presently in Manus will be defined after the ministerial bilateral talks in December. 
This has created a dilemma for me because when I agreed to this topic, I assumed that the report and policy would be public documents for discussion by now and no longer confidential materials. I have sought and been granted permission at the bureaucratic level to discuss the outcomes of our work in general terms only and will do so later. I will also discuss another matter that very close to my heart and, and my former policy work as a minister, the matter of internally displaced people in Papua New Guinea and one of the main reasons why I was very uncomfortable with the idea of us taking on international refugees when we haven't been able to manage our own internally displaced person situation. But let's look historically. The Pacific region is historically a region of people on the move. It started with waves of migration of the indigenous people who settled the islands of the vast Pacific Ocean, including, of course, the largest island of Australia, and it has no end, because there will always be people on the move in human societies for expansion and acquisition of land and resources, or searching for a better life, or escaping from famine or poverty, or being displaced by natural disasters. People move because of a complexity of push and pull factors, and when people, cultures, tribes, nations and religions interface as a result of movement, there will always be complex dimensions and moral dilemmas. It is usually initially a very uncomfortable interface with unpredictable outcomes, so time is needed to work it through. Papua New Guinea itself is based on a history of people on the move. Archaeological and linguistic evidence indicates that thousands of years ago, two main waves of people migrated to populate the land of New Guinea. The non-Austronesian speaking tribes who tended to be inland and later the Austronesian Malay language influences that tended to dominate on the coast. Within this complexity are microcosms of complex movements. For example, oral history and archaeology documents the movement of my late husband's village as a result of inter-village wars. And the indigenous Motu Koitabu tribes of Port Moresby are now under new threats because of movements of people within our country. That story is a complex lecture in itself for someone else. Hundreds of years ago, new waves of people came on the move to Papua New Guinea. The colonial administrators, the three M's of missionaries, mercenaries and misfits, the hangover of the complex dimensions and moral dilemmas of that movement still has considerable impact, both positive and negative, on the people and the development of Papua New Guinea. It's another interesting complex area for to research and, and lecture about. Then the 1940s saw the people of Papua New Guinea dragged into a foreign war that they did not understand. The temporary movement of opposing foreign troops into Papua New Guinea disrupted the livelihood of people who were forced to leave their land. For example, again, my husband's village, Pari villages, were relocated from their present site because it was near the army barracks of the 1st Pacific Island uh, Regiment, to be relocated on other people's land until the war was over. Both before and after independence, right until the present day, Papua New Guinea has been dealing with the issue of people on the move seeking asylum. It is not a new thing to us. West Papuan refugees have been a part of Papua New Guinea life for decades with the advantage of similar Melanesian cultures that helps the integration, but different languages, of course. This movement has been managed under administrative arrangements which commenced during colonial times without any policy framework. So there certainly is a need for a refugee settlement policy in Papua New Guinea, regardless of the, the Manas phenomena. There was an influx of West Papuan educated elite in the 1960s. Dr. Danamira, people of that that some people here might know, and quite a few held high positions in the public service. Chris Margin was head of the hospital for many, many years in Port Moresby. Then later came about 10,000 West Papuans who fled Irianjaya in 1983 to 84 and were accommodated in North Fly in East Arwen, a refugee camp that still exists, and near Vanimo in the Blackwater camp which is now closed 
but the expert panel visited the site during our consultative process. Some of the leaders of this influx of, what, of the West Papuan refugees were sent to Manus, and some were later accepted as refugees in Sweden, particularly those who were um, definitely in, in danger of their lives. Many stayed on in Manus and have now melded into those communities that married and are valued. Similarly, some West Papuans ended up in Port Moresby and are well accepted, but are faced with problems of land tenure. Some are or will become PNG citizens, and, but some are still hoping to be resettled in, a, in a, another developed country and have also been talking with the Council of Chiefs of Vanuatu. The issue of internally displaced persons emerged through the 1990s with thousands of Bougainvilleans in care centres, avoiding both the Bougain Revolutionary Army, Army and the PNG Defence Force. Now, in 2014, the issue of internally displaced persons as a result of urbanisation, squatting and evictions in our main cities has emerged as something that can no longer be ignored, but is being ignored. But I will talk more about that later. After 1994, the Tolai were displaced from Rabaul and Mataput, etc., to Vunapope and Kokopo after the volcanic eruptions. And before that time, Mount Lamington had that impact about 1950 in Oro province. More recent volcanic eruptions uh, on offshore islands in the Badang coast have forced relocation of people to other tribes' lands on the mainland. It has been fraught with problems and they are still simmering and included deaths between the tribal groups over land. We have now also faced the issue of people on the move because of the effects of climate change on their livelihoods, not only in the small um, Pacific, na Pacific nations, but also in the offshore islands of Bougainville, a relocation exercise had to be um, put in place. So Papua New Guinea has a long history of people on the move, both internationally and internally, and from a variety of push and pull factors. And what about Australia, my birth country? I met my late husband during the time of the white Australia policy. It was an interesting courtship. But we settled in the black colony, away from the white Australian policy, which was destined for a, nat a natural death anyway. The policy did, however, reflect the attitudes of perhaps a large segment of the population who had never acknowledged that they themselves were the descendants of people on the move. I left Australia in the late 1960s when the urban population demographics reflected that racist policy. And now I travel to and from to Australian cities and I marvel at the diversity of human beings that are now proudly called Australia their home in this multicultural society. In preparing for tonight, I have spoken with many people and some tell me there was initial resentment of assistance to the Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees in Australia in the 1980s, but now they are accepted. Bright and beautiful and great food is the way it was described to me. More recently, until the latest eruption of xenophobia, media reports indicated that in many communities which have Middle Eastern refugees, they have been accepted as valuable stimulation for the economy and society, energetic, hard-working people dealing with their trauma and building new lives. Again, that was a description given to me by an Australian. One lesson comes from all these cases of people on the move in Papua New Guinea, Australia, or anywhere, is that the issues can't be solved overnight or in a huge rush or by knee-jerk policy solutions. However, it came to the stage that Australia was facing another complex issue with deep moral dimensions and imperative political implications leading up to an election. Increased numbers of people were arriving illegally in boats seeking asylum in Australia and there was a political and public call, not all public, but a public call to stop the boats with their mixture of genuine refugees and economic migrants and the tragedy of the drownings of innocent peoples. In March 2011, the outcomes of the Fourth Regional Ministerial Conference on People Smuggling, Trafficking and Related Transnational Crime held in Indonesia had a very interesting statement that I think uh, was a basis of the policy to come. It 
To quote, it recognized the serious and urgent humanitarian and border security challenge presented to regional countries by people smuggling and recommended encouraging sub-regional and bilateral arrangements to create disincentives for irregular travel through possible <laughs> transfer arrangements. The Papua New Guinea agreed to help Australia in its bilateral relationships within this regional framework, and in return, to receive a very generous aid package. In 2012-2013, Papua, Papua New Guinea agreed with Prime Minister Gillard's desire for an effective processing centre to be reopened. And then by Prime Minister, um, Ministers, Prime Minister Rudd's settlement policy, resettlement policy of no entry to Australia as a deterrence to people resorting to illegal entry into Australia by boat. And thus the regional resettlement arrangement was signed by Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister O'Neill. This is supported by detailed processes for the transfer of asylum seekers to the regional processing centre on Minas Island. A beautiful island with talented, friendly people, which by media hysteria has been painted as a hellhole in the international advertising in the source regions of asylum seekers. The 2013 agreement talks of offshore processing and resettlement in Papua New Guinea as a dissentive, and it has been put, as it has been put, is resented by many of those who think about it. And it was resented in most areas we went for our consultations. This approach has now been adopted by the present government in, here and in Papua, and Papua New Guinea is struggling to cope with the issue and what it's signed off on and all its requirements, which is described as challenging by your Australian Minister. But we in Papua New Guinea were not at all prepared for this new agreement that we quickly signed off on for an economic passage. We had signed the, the International Convention, the Refugee Convention, but with seven reservations that had to be removed. We, had, we, we did not have a policy. We, there were many things that were not in place and we had many internal things to, to deal with ourselves. I am not making a value judgment on any of the politicians involved. I have spent 15 years in politics and know how complex it can be to answer to a multiplicity of demands and criticisms. But whose problem is it? Is it a regional problem? Is it Australia's problem? Should PNG be the solution to the problem? It's a very complex issue. I will be quite honest, when the RRA, the Regional Resettlement Agreement, was announced, I was actually in Fiji at the time with Governor Gary Jufa at a Regional Green Growth Initiative Leaders Movement, and I was really angry, and it was the first time I spoke publicly after retiring from, polit retiring from politics, because it happened so suddenly, and I think the public in both countries knew very little about it. So when I was asked to chair the expert panel to prepare a draft refugee settlement policy for PNG, I was taken by surprise and actually said, but you know I've spoken out very clearly against this policy. I am certainly not an expert on these matters, but I had a very experienced and talented team of Papua New Guineans. Our instructions were that the policy was to provide a high-level framework for the integration within Papua New Guinea of all people who are determined to be refugees under the Migration Act 1978 by the Foreign Affairs Minister, including, and this was a good thing, the West Papuan refugees. So at last we were going to be dealing with their issues of citizenship that they've never been able to get and things like that. So including the West Papuan refugees, refugees who had been transferred to Papua New Guinea under the regional resettlement arrangements with Australia, and refugees who independently sought asylum in Papua New Guinea. Because occasionally people do end up on our shores. Actually at present there's a man who originates from India and he was a Christian escaping from an area where he felt uncomfortable and ended up on our shores and is living in a community making his chapatis waiting for processing and hoping to feel, um, bring his family from India and he's loving it there. So we, we do have people just turning up on our shores. Very recently, when I was working on a, the resettlement, relocation of some uh, squatters on a, on a very iconic hill in our city, I came across two young Yugoslavian ladies inside a, a little shack in this settlement. 
It was terribly difficult to try to work with them. The mother only spoke Yugoslavia, and the, woman, the young woman wouldn't come out of the house and pretended not to speak English, but I found out later she did know English. And they wouldn't move, so I got the migration people, and I got a mental health specialist, and I got the police to come and try to get them out. Eventually, they had to be arrested um, and put under house arrest while they were being checked into. But as it is, they don't qualify as refugees, so I don't know their fate. The policy was to focus on utilising the existing strengths of existing strengths of refugees to enable them to rebuild their lives as quickly as possible in safe and secure environments within Papua New Guinea. And the policy also stated that if they were being settled within a particular community, they must not live beyond the means of that community. So it means that Australia's assistance would have to upgrade the means of that community as well, which could become quite a huge mammoth task. Consultations in five strategically chosen provinces. Manus for obvious reasons, and that was a kind of difficult consultation. We found it uncomfortable. Madang, Madang because of their experience in resettlement after the volcanic eruptions. Sundown province, which borders with Iria and Jaya, and thus had the West Papuan refugee experience. West New Britain province, because of its experience with small holding oil, block, oil plant blocks. And we thought optimistically that maybe uh, that people, some of the refugees that chose to be settled in Papua New Guinea could end up in royal oil palm blocks. But it was very clear from West New Britain oil palm that they said, no, there's no chance. We might like to, but already our oil palm blocks have now second and third generation children who have no space on the blocks and are now living on the outskirts of the city in squatter settlements. So that wasn't going to be an, an option. And Eastern Highlands to look at the situation there. In general, looking at the provin provinces, didn't give many options. And in general, the governors said, look, too difficult, we have too many problems ourselves to deal with. But the total air feeling was not negative. Papua New Guineans are compassionate people, although there was this fear of terrorist type thing um, uh, permeating some of the discussions. <coughs> in, ad in addition, we had consultations with the Chamber of Commerce and Business Houses, women's groups, international NGOs, PNG NGOs, the Christian churches, and the Islamic Society of Papua New Guinea. The general feedback was acceptance of the regional processing centre on Manus to be reopened. There was no worries about that. People were quite accepting of that. But there was generally a rejection of the concept of resettlement of processed genuine refugees in Papua New Guinea. In general, people felt sympathy for the people in the regional processing centre, but the common theme was that Papua New Guinea has enough complex problems of its own in with internally displaced people and struggling services and should not be the solution to another country's problem. This came through quite loudly in our consultations. Thus, quite a bit of anger was expressed against both governments for the lack of consultation in, in the process. It is a reflection of our people's compassion that many organizations and business houses, churches, Islamic society, and I'm saying the Christian churches too, the international NGOs did say that if this bilateral agreement remains, they would do what they could to assist governments, both governments, with the integration of genuine refugees, but they emphasized it would have to be in limited numbers uh, and there would have to be some provisos. The processing has been done by Papua New Guinean team who have been uh, appointed to this work and so there is a learning experience going on and they're being mentored by the Australian Department of Immigration and Border Protection on the whole process involved in the processing of asylum seekers. When the expert panel was in Manus for consultations in April, already over 300 asylum seekers had chosen retur to return to their countries of origin with the assistance of the International Org Organization for Migration, IOM. In fact, the plane we flew out on, there were two young men who were, had chosen, well, they're going home, they didn't want to be in PNG. So, yeah. So, perhaps this, uh, and, and at my briefings earlier this week from both PNG and Australian sources, this number has now increased of the people who have chosen to go home. Clearly, the disincentive of Papua New Guinea, that hellhole to the north, is working, but does not do much for PNG's public image. <laughs> All transferees have gone through their initial interview. 
Some have indicated that they would be willing to be resettled in Papua New Guinea once the processing and determinations are completed. Not all have been processed, and when we were on Manus in April, there was about a dozen or twenty had been gone through and said yes, they'd be willing to quite a number be willing to settle in Papua New Guinea, but they're waiting to the final stage where the minister signs off. Quite a number are just waiting and perhaps hoping that the recently introduced temporary protection visa for Australia might be applied to him to them, but I believe from other sources that there is no hope of that. But it seems that they will remain in limbo until December, and one just hopes that a resolution to the whole sad, and it has been tragic situation, will come soon after that. I enjoyed the work chairing the expert panel because regardless of the MANA situation and the regional resettlement agreement, Papua New Guinea does need a refugee settlement policy, and it also needs a multiculturalism policy to underpin not only a refugee policy, but also how to unify the multiplicity of tribes in Papua New Guinea into one nation. We do not have a multiculturalism policy, so that was a side recommendation. It was not part of our terms of reference, but we made sure we kind of got it in as a side recommendation. That further work needed to be done to develop an underpinning multiculturalism policy and an internally displaced persons policy within the urbanisation policy of Papua New Guinea. Both extremely important pieces of work that have not yet been done. As you would know, Papua New Guinea has over 800 languages and tribal groups, and tribal conflict is still a common occurrence. It has come right into the urban centres. We are a multicultural society and in need of policy to underpin this. And it has become acute because of the rate of urbanisation has increased and our cities are now melting pots of diversity and are unable to provide land and services for the increased urban migration. Squatter settlements have become common in our cities and towns and evictions by private companies and government authorities are com common and result in thousands, and I mean it, thousands of internally displaced, displaced people. I was told last week when I was at City Hall that about 1750 people will be bulldozed next week. And I said, where are they going? They said, that's not our problem. I said, but they're citizens of Papua New Guinea. But that's the situation we're facing, because it is the too hard basket, because the government does not have land, over 90%, it used to be 97, not sure what it is now, but over 90% of the land in Papua New Guinea is customarily earned. It comes to the point, many of them do not want to or cannot return to their villages. Some of them have escaped tribal fighting, some of them just have been born and bred in Port Moresby, and they cannot escape back to their, go back to their villages. People in their villages would say, who are you? You have no land here. You left here a long time ago. So we have that phenomenon now. We always said, and even when I was in Parliament, people used to say to me, there are no landless people in Papua New Guinea. But it's not true. And it's a piece of research that needs to be done properly, getting some idea of the, the percentage of landless people as it grows in Papua New Guinea. Because some research was done by a couple of, a married couple from Western Australian University of the Sepik. They were actually Sepik people who were, were um, evicted from the plantations in Rabaul. It was found they did not go back home to Sepik. They ended up drifting to other areas because they were psychologically landless. So we have to accept this fact and deal with it, but we're tending to put our head in the sand. Personally, to be really honest, I would prefer our government and our international de development partners focus on these internal complex issues and moral dilemmas before taking on the complexities of international refugee settlement. But we are part of the global society. So we recognise that we do also have responsibilities as well in our region and in the global society. I will finish on something that may ruffle some feathers, but I would like some bi general, bi genuine bilateral cooperation to be given to enhancing opportunities for regional migration in the Pacific. The Pacific Institute of Public Policy has released its latest briefing paper by Brian Opskin and Theresa McDermott of Macquarie University that examines international migration in the Pacific and argues there should be greater opportunities for the people of Pacific countries to migrate between their home states and the developed states of the Pacific Rim. 
Derek Bryan, the executive director of PIPP, says, the relative success of the seasonal worker scheme in New Zealand serves as an example of how pragmatic migration policies can contribute to the development story of the Pacific. More needs to be done to open up new migration pathways that consider the special needs of some Pacific Island countries, notably Kiribati, Tuvalu and Nauru, as well as the Melanesian states of Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. The briefing paper suggests that creating more permeable waters, quite a frightening concept probably, is an important means of redressing past and current injustices, expanding opportunities for human development, and fostering stronger regional relations. It further points out that both the United States and New Zealand have been reasonably generous in facilitating migration from Micronesia and Polynesia. It is Australia that stands out as the Pacific neighbour with the greatest capacity to develop new migration streams that recognise Australia's history as a colonising power, its self-interest in promoting regional security and the special needs of some Pacific island countries. I'm keeping myself safe by quoting other people. <laughs> there is a moral dilemma in the fact that our educated elite are welcome. This is my own fact. There is a moral dilemma in the fact that our educated elite are welcome and we suffer from brain drain, drain, but little is offered to provide learning and remittance opportunities for the less skilled of Papua New Guinea. The seasonal worker scheme announced in 2008 takes a small but very, very valuable step along this path and I pray that it will be developed further and look into all sorts of area. Papua New Guineans make wonderful carers of the elderly if there's ever a need in that area. Yeah. Uh, Brian further suggests that as we now live in a world where travel and communication technology makes the exchange of people and skills easier and more affordable than ever, it is time to revisit migration policies in the context of national development strategies. <laughs> Papua New Guineans still feel great affection for Australia and they expressed disappointment during our consultations that Australia was sending its problems to Papua New Guinea. However, I have no doubt that that disappointment would not be ex expressed so clearly if there were enhanced opportunities for regional migration between Papua New Guinea and Australia, and a more vibrant seasonal and temporary worker schemes could be one such opportunity. The Pacific region will be the recipient of new waves of migration. It is already happening waves of migration that have concerned geopolitical uh, dynamics as more people from China came into the Pacific. I did notice a greater interest of the United States in the Pacific. That's the nature of geopolitics. But let us maintain our Pacific origins and our Pacific identity and understand our Pacific neighbours first. Regional security and solidarity is much more than regional processing centres in Manus and regional settlement agreements, which may or may not come to full fruition or could process a certain group of people and then die a natural death. We don't know what's going to come out of this whole thing. How many Australians actually know very much about the reality of their nearest northern neighbour, other than the negative media stereotyping? Very few. Thank you for giving up your time on a Friday night to attend this 2014 Fusion Lecture. <laughs>